Good morning. So as we start here, we get to our final stages of our trip through the days of remembrance, the days that the Lord designated as feasts. And he designated these, we have found, for very particular reasons. This whole study has been just drenched in what they call typology. And I haven't used that term before because I don't like using those big theological terms. But basically, they foreshadowed what Jesus would then fulfill. So we saw in the Passover that Jesus, the Passover lamb, whose blood was shed for the, for, to prevent us from death. We saw in the Feast of Unleavened Bread that Jesus' spotless life, his life that was free from any form of sin, was met by the life and walk of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits, the first fruits of what would come. And then we see that after that initial harvest that occurred at the resurrection of Christ, we saw that a second resurrection of a lot of people occurred when their lives were changed at Pentecost. All of those foreshadowed early in the feast that the Lord designated. Then we get to the fall feasts, and we've seen the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of the Day of Atonement, things that haven't been fulfilled yet, things that are coming up. And now we get to the Feast of Tabernacles. Today we begin our explanation of that final feast Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called the Feast of Booths, because the word for tabernacle can, is also used for booths. And it, and it refers to that time period where the people of Israel were in the desert, and they were heading for 40 years to the Promised Land. Prior to delving, though, into the particulars of the feast itself, there are some aspects about what had or what would happen that play a part in the symbolism of the feast celebration that needs to be understood. Um, these also are used by Jesus Christ to explain and complete his mission on earth or are said of Christ after he had ascended into heaven. I'll admit that there is some degree of complexity to what I'm going to present here. We're in the land of meat. This is fugo de chao. We are not in a milk area. So I would, I would ask that you attend your mind. You're going to actually have to think about this. Because as I was preparing it, I got to a point, and Cheryl walked in. She goes, what's wrong with you? And I said, my head hurts. It just made my head hurt. It's just that complex and that deep. It's also wonderful. It's wonderful when the Lord lays this out. Hopefully, he has figured this out in everything so that I can lay this out. And afterwards, you'll say, that was quite simple, Cornelius. Why did your head hurt? And I'll be like, well, because the Lord hadn't cleared it, clarified it yet. <laughs> All right. So I'm choosing to start not in the past. I'm actually choosing to start in the New Testament, and we're going to work backwards. And there's a reason for that, because I think it's more easily understood if you see how the fulfillment occurred, and then you'll see why the Lord set the feast up the way he did. So, we're going to start in the epistle, 1 John. 1 John is where we're going to start. And uh, we're going to start in chapter 5, which some have described as a photo album. That's how they say that 1 John is. Unlike uh, modern-day heretics, John describes Christians as bearing certain attributes. They resolutely claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They love the Father and all His children. They obey His commandments. And they do not continue sinning. Oh, yes. He gets us. He also expects us to obey him. He says it multiple times all through scripture. So, instead of, uh, this, this is an important uh, epistle. 
in this day and age where rethinking of the gospel is taking place. In John's time, the Gnostics were claiming new insights and inspiration that altered the content of the Bible. We see this occurring in the church today, where plainly understood texts are being recast in the light, more like darkness, of the world's opinion. Currently, a belief exists that humans exist on a spectrum of relative proximity to the Lord. It's all a continuum. People are somewhere along the scale. Sounds very nice. Unfortunately, it's not scriptural. Scripture states that it's, a, it's different. It's binary. By contrast, the Bible states that we are in one of two positions. We are saved or we are unsaved. There's A or B. There is no C. It's simply how Scripture places it. We're eternally with God, or we are eternally in the lake of fire. That's just the way the Bible puts it. This is a very unpopular portion of Scripture today, but is the reality of meeting, the meaning of the words contained. How then do we distinguish between these groups? How do we know where a person stays? Um, you will note that I'm going to be reading in this portion from two different translations. I have chosen this on purpose. It's so that we'll understand it better. Um, this portion of scripture, 1 John chapter 5, contains an area of debate that talks about the comma Johannium or uh, Kama Johannine. This is a theological thing. It all has to do with whether a comma was present in, the, in, in one verse or the comma wasn't present. And because of that comma, there's a difference between some of our translations. I have presented one of the translations, and I'll explain why I did in just a little bit. But... Um, there is a trinity that John is making a point about with Jesus and the proof of his divinity. So let's read from the text. First John, but oh, regarding this, um, there is in this, there is a statement about in one translation, King James, there's a statement of the, of the trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In other translations, that's absent, okay? It doesn't matter whether it's there or not. Here's why. All these verses here that I have on the screen, they all talk about the Trinity. So there's no, you don't, the verse doesn't have to be there to support the existence of the Trinity because all those other verses and more all support the existence of the Trinity. So if, there's, it's not like it's saying something that isn't present in many other places in Scripture. All right, so now on to the Scripture itself. You see those yellow, yellow verses here, the parts in yellow? That's the argument part. That's the part that many say, that wasn't there. It depends on whether you think the comma was there or not. I left, the, I, I left it in because it helps to explain uh, parts of the Scripture. Okay, so that's why it's going to be there. I read. First one, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. To verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. And there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. And if we, agree, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. 
He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that, that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, John begins by not merely making a statement of fact. Jesus was born of God. But he's saying more is required than simply knowing the fact. How do we know that? Remember, the demons know the fact. What they don't do is love, believe, or follow their creator, God. Each person has to have had a time where they believe in the Father and commit themselves to the Son. This results in the amazing, merciful grace of God covering the new believer's life, thus paying for their offense with a currency they could not possibly possess. Beyond simply the manuscript debates that the uh, next verses, verses 7 and 8, and they have been debated very richly, I might add. Um, there are a number of things that can be drawn out of this. John makes statements about doctrine. Quote, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth for only, but for only but by water and blood, and it is the... Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm reading this wrong. <laughs> For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. You see, we've got trinities going on here. And if you look at the KJV version... They are trying to set up a comparison. They are stating, look, in heaven there are three. The divinity, the, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It refers to it as the word we know from this John writing this. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. Okay, So the word is referring to Jesus Christ. Um, He's setting up, there's this trinity being set up. And on earth, he's saying there's yet another trinity that is reflecting what exists in heaven. But it's kind of, to our minds, kind of obscure, at least it is to me. Like when you say, when I hear that, I'm sort of like, huh? How, how, how is that? It doesn't, it doesn't uh, the, the correlation is not obvious. How does water and blood Bear witness to the deity of Christ. First, let's look at this. Christ comes through natural birth to Mary. And we know that natural birth is accompanied with quite a loss of blood and water. Water being amniotic fluid, if you want to be technical. Um, and we know that the Spirit was witnessed to testify to Jesus' status in one of those Interstate 316 verses, if we look at uh, Matthew 316, and Jesus, when he was baptized in water, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What a wondrous thing to observe, to have been there. How did Jesus' natural birth and the Spirit's proclamation speak to Jesus' divinity at all times? Think about that. What the Gnostics were capable of seeing was, were the changed lives of the true Christians. They could see that. 
that they could deny. See, what the, the heresy of the Gnostics was that they thought that the deity of Christ left him at Gethsemane or sometime before the cross, okay? Because they couldn't see uh, a, a God allowing himself to be crucified. But if he's not crucified, then he's not resurrected. If he's not crucified, our, our debt's not paid. So this is fundamental stuff right here. He had to be there. He had to be, he had to be crucified because that's the payment for what our sins deserve. And it was a cruel way to die. And he had to be born again. Um, so this was critical. But the Gnostics could see these Christians are different. And we should look the same way. We, our lives should look radically different to an unsaved world in which we exist. And if it doesn't, there's a problem. If we engage in the activities of the outside world, if we're, if we're drawn just nonstop to the interests of the outside world, there's a problem. There's something fundamentally wrong. And the modern day Gnostics will look at us and they will not see that there's a difference between the saved and the unsaved. If we see these three witnesses, spirit, water, and blood, conferring the regeneration of life that the spirit does, the cleansing of the water the, that the redeemed get from their sin, the blood making atonement for our sin, then this makes more sense if you look at it like that. Our transformed lives can easily be seen by an all. So let's flesh this out yet just a, a little bit more. It is stated in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Or let's look at 2 Corinthians Verse 5, uh, subsection B. Our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. Now let's look at the next element. That's the first witness that exists in this, this little trinity here. The next is the water. And if we look into Jesus' references into the water, we see numerous places. John 13, verse 9, says the following. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my heart. Jesus said to him, he that is washed needs not save to what, but to wash his feet. But is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all, because he knew Judas was there. Uh, Jesus here is washing the feet of his disciples, and he's stating the cleansing has to occur. What's cleansed? The parts that's dirty. And that's what we all need before we've accepted Christ. We need that cleansing in the clean water, living water that Jesus has to offer. Um, we also can't forget Jesus' discussion of rebirth that occurred with Nicodemus. That's found in John 3, 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Or... Let's go jump over to where he's at the, uh, at the well with the Samaritan woman. John 4.10 and, and verse 14, um, where he states that he is the source of living water, a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. You know, I'm going to just go off on a little bit of a, a jog aside here. Where was this at? Well, it was in Samaria, Cornelius. It's a Samaritan woman. Yeah, but Where? in Samaria was he at? It was at Sychar. At Sychar. And that, that was a land that had been given that Joseph actually had, that had been given to Joseph by Jacob, 
who had bought it from Hamor. Jacob had dug the well that they were at. It was called Jacob's well. Think about that. That's where he went to meet, where he's meeting that Samaritan woman. Not just some random well. He was meeting her at Jacob's well. Why? He has a reason for everything. Well, Samaritans saw Jacob as their ancestor. Jews saw Jacob as their ancestor. And so what he did was he went on at a point where they were had it in common. He goes, this we have in common. Come, let's meet. Now, let me tell you some truth. And he hits her with the truth that he was the source of living water. And we heard earlier today the salvation comes from whom? The Jews. It comes from Jews because the salvation comes from Jesus Christ. You know, that well still exists today. It has a, you know, they're always building churches and edifices on top of these things. But that, that well, you can go there today. It's still there. It's in the uh, Nablus neighborhood by, uh, uh, called, uh, uh, it's outside of Nablus at a, in a suburb called Tel Balata. It's on the West Bank. But Jesus, Jesus uses that common ground to reach that Samaritan woman. You know, in John 7, 37, he says the following. In the last day, and I'm going to just tell you when he's saying this, John 7, 37. This was at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, that's why I'm going on this jog. Okay. Feast of Tabernacles. John 7, 37. In the last day, uh, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive of the Holy Ghost, was not yet given, because uh, that Jesus was not yet glorified. See, Jesus used the feasts to point people back and say, remember this standard. It's pointing to me. He said this over and over again. Look at the Old Testament, what the prophets said. It points to me. Look at this feast. It points to me. Everything points to me. Why? Because I purposed that way back then. I was trying to prepare you so that you could see everything's pointing to my presence on the, on the earth. He had made, we had seen this connection though previously. It was seen in Isaiah. If you look in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 2, it says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee uh, from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jer Jerusalem, uh, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring and they shall spring up as among the grass as willows by the water courses. Going even further uh, back um, we will see that uh, we'll see that uh, water brought life to the people of Israel caught in captivity. How do we know that? Who led people who led the Israelites out of captivity? Moses. Moses. What does Moses mean? Drawn out of water. Get it? The name isn't a coincidence. The name was purposed. Everything has a purpose. Exodus 2.10, And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. It's very cool. Look at the details in Scripture. They all point to Jesus. Okay, now regarding the witness of the blood, Jesus himself stated in Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, uh, as well as it's also restated succinctly in uh, 1 John 1, 7b providing that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. 
We can also look at Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by Jesus Christ, um, but ugh, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The power is in the blood, Leviticus. Consider what happens when water and blood come together, though. How about that? Well, what happened uh, in the plagues? The water in the river became blood. And what happened? Death. Everything died. Why? Because it was supposed to be water. The river was turned into blood. That's Exodus 7, verse 15 to 25. Uh, what happened with Calvary when water and blood came together? Well, that was when Jesus' side was pierced and water and blood was produced. And what was occurring? Death. This is John 19, 34. You know, it's not casual. The colors associated with this, the blood, the color of blood that I've used here, and the color of water, those are obvious. Um, the question is, why did I choose green for the spirit? Well, um, there is a couple of statements in Scripture that sort of uh, lend itself to that, 1 Corinthians 15, 42. Um, it states the following. Uh, so also is the resurrection of the dead. If it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. These are all references to grow, to a plant growing sown. You sow growing plants. Plants are green. Um, why would I state that the Lord was associated with things that are green? Well, I don't know. John 5, 5 uh, 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Um, that's why I chose the green. Why does this make any difference what color I show, chose for these panels? Because, remember, the witnesses are one. And when you put those witnesses together, the green, the blue, and the red, RGBiv, any of you color people, you get white. White light. Light coming from the sun is, consumed, is composed of red, blue, blue green. You take one away and you see the others. Okay? It all, the Lord's, His majesty is beyond statement. Everything is purposed in His creation. He is a scientist of the highest order. Ultimately, Scripture reflects not only the New Testament events, but it also hearkens the reader back to that which happened long ago before. Let's look at a time period of Exodus. Now we're getting past closer to the actual Feast of Tabernacles time, um, where the first there is uh, protection from death by the shedding of blood at the Passover. Then there is protection from death by passage through the water at the Red Sea. Next, the people begin to complain due to lack of water at the pools of Marah, where the water was bitter. Those pools are still there today, too. We know why they're bitter. You want to know why? Just out of curiosity? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about these things. Still exists. It has a bunch of metallic impurities in it. Still there today. Still tastes bitter. Um, but uh, those impurities the Lord took care of. He reveals his role as the healer by purifying the contaminated waters with a local tree. You see this in Exodus 15 verse 25 and 26. And what does he say? I am, an I am statement, I am the Lord that heals thee. The Lord is healer. The second episode takes forth a little bit further down the road when they arrive at Mount Horeb and they have no source of water. 
And the Lord states the following. This is Exodus 17, 6. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So what does this foreshadow? I don't know. Let's go to Uncle Thompy's here, favorite chapter of the, of the Bible, Isaiah 53. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. When Moses goes to strike the rock, Horeb, what's he going to strike first? Remember with the statement, I will stand before thee there upon the rock. You have to strike the Lord in order to strike the rock because he's standing before the rock. It's obvious. Not only that, we're going to get to later, not only is he before the rock, he is the rock. We'll hit that in just a little bit. We'll, we'll circle back to that. Okay. When does this also occur? Well, it occurs at Calvary because when the Lord was struck, what happened? Redemption was brought. There was a harvest of healer, a harvest of believers that could begin. There was a second episode with water, though. A second episode that caused a lot of trouble for Moses. The people start grumbling in Numbers 20. They start grumbling once again, we have no water. All these episodes, there is no water, the Lord delivers. There is no water, the Lord delivers. But, the, but it's just, uh, we're the same way today. Something happens, and I sit and I think, oh no, this is terrible. Calamity's coming. He's done all these things for me all through my life. And as soon as calamity happens, I'm like, oh no, this is terrible. Instead of thinking, the Lord's taking care of everything before he's going to take care of this. That should be my instinct. Unfortunately, it's not always my instinct. I'm going to be truthful with you. It takes a little, it's like there's like a couple of beats and I think, settle down, pray about it, he's got this. But it should be automatic. It should be automatic. And that's how we have to be. We look back at the Israelites and we think, these people are ridiculous. He's done all these amazing things for us. We're not any different. At least I'm not. I'll be truthful with you. Okay, so they're grumbling because they don't have any water. It's Numbers 20. This is what it says. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Verse 6, And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak you unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to the, them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beast to drink. Verse 11, And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. What was Moses' fundamental error? Was it that he disobeyed the Lord's words? He did. It's not just that, though. He didn't just not obey the Lord's command. The Lord says he did not believe what the Lord had said. Something much deeper and more fundamental. He did not believe what the Lord had said. So what did Moses do? He leaned on his own understanding and experience. He had the rod. He had used it before to deliver water to the people. So that must be the correct action, right? I've used it before. It worked just fine. Let's do it again. It's not what the Lord said. 
It's not what the Lord said. He leaned on his own understanding. What does God desire? Fundamentally, belief resulting in obedience. Belief resulting in obedience, even if it does not fit with our experiences. Why God requested that he speak to the rock? Must have had a reason. Think about it. What does the rock represent? Well, remember what I said before, that the rock was the Lord? Um, the rock represents God. How do we know that? In the Exodus 17 episode at Horeb, the word used for rock is zur, T-Z-U-R, zur. And in Numbers 20, the word used for rock is selah. You know, everyone referred to the, the band selah, it's the rock, okay? Here, um, the, and zur means strength. It's not just a, it's not just a rock, it's, it's a strong rock, Okay. Deuteronomy uh, 32, 3, the Moses puts these all together. He says the following, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe you greatness unto our God. He is the rock, sur. He is the rock, and his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth. And without iniquity, just and right is he. Down to verse 13. He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock, sur, or no, selah, and, and oil out of the flinty rock, sur. He's using both in the same sentence. Uh, verse 15. And Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked Thou art waxen fat, thou art uh, grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which had made him, and lightly esteemed the rock, sur, of his salvation. Verse 18, of the rock that began thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Verse 31, for their rock, sur, is not, I mean, uh, their rock is, Eben, which is a different word for rock, is not our rock, sur. Uh, even our enemies themselves being judges. You'll notice in your, in your uh, translation that the wor word for rock, other than the one that was even, uh, the word is capitalized because it is the Lord he's speaking of. Okay, so the Lord is the rock. So what... Let's get back to what was the big deal that Moses hadn't followed the commands precisely? Because it was supposed to foreshadow an event of the future. What event involves speaking with your mouth and believing with your heart upon God to provide? Is there a circumstance that comes to mind? Salvation. Isn't that interesting? We were talking about that first thing this morning. Isn't that interesting? Ha! Huh, what a coincidence. Amazing how the Spirit works. Yes, salvation. That's what it was supposed. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesses, mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, who believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Moses was supposed to enact a typological foreshadowing of the second harvest. Pentecost. That's what he was supposed to be foreshadowing. Jesus in his death was the fulfillment of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. That was supposed to foreshadow Pentecost. Let's go to Acts 2, verse 1, at the time of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them 
uh, cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 14, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs on the earth beneath. Blood and fire will, will pour and pour out smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were all pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. In the same day there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. Spirit water, and blood. What are they? They are one witness. And when you put them together, you see the holy, righteous, and unblemished light of the Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we delve into these things, some of these things are pretty dense. It's, it's, you have to concentrate in order to fully appreciate all that's contained therein. But you, Lord God, are the great opener of mysteries to us. You will show us those dark mysteries. We only have to apply our minds and our hearts to you, and you will come and dwell within us through the workings of your spirit that you've given to all those that believe upon you. Lord God, we do wish to look different than those around us, not to be different, but to, sh to glorify your holy name. We pray, Lord God, that you would do that work within us that needs to occur so that we will not dull your great brightness that exists within us. Lord God, we pray that you will use us not just to glorify your name, but you will use us to witness to a world that's dying. There's death occurring all around us, Lord God. Let us not be unconcerned about us. Let us act. You have to show us when and where to act and how to act and give us the words to speak and when not to speak. That's what we need, Lord God, your complete guidance. And then we have to lean not on our understanding. We have to do what you tell us to do and nothing but what you tell us to do. And then your pictures will be complete and all will understand. These things we pray for in your blessed name. Amen.